You're listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. Episode 18, The Wide World Episode 17 was part one of a three-episode arc looking at the role of toys, fairy tales, and games in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, so if you missed that, you should go back. If you're just listening to this episode rather than watching on YouTube, I recommend watching the video when it's available. I'll be talking about many things that are easier to understand when you can see the images. To find video versions of all episodes of Quantum Harry, go to at QH Podcast on Twitter. The pinned tweet has a link to the Quantum Harry episode guide, which links to all episodes in audio and video formats. In Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Harry, Ron, and Hermione play a life-sized chess game, Professor McGonagall's contribution to the defense of the Philosopher's Stone. In Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, J.K. Rowling designs the Triwizard Tournament to be a life-sized board game. That there are four, rather than three, tournament champions helps draw attention to this. Multiple board games have been based upon Harry Potter, and the Hogwarts houses have for their chief colors red, yellow, blue, and green. Colors commonly used for board game playing pieces around the world. The Hogwarts houses also align with the four elements that medieval alchemists recognized, fire, earth, water, and air. Gryffindor aligns with the element of fire, has a lion for its mascot, the symbol for Leo, an astrological fire sign which happens to be Harry's and J.K. Rowling's birth sign, and Rowling has assigned to this house the fiery colors of red and gold. Hufflepuff aligns with the element of earth. It has the burrowing badger for its mascot, and Professor Sprout, the herbology teacher, is Hufflepuff's head of house. Slytherin aligns with the element of water, in Chamber of Secrets, a snake, the symbol of Slytherin, moved through the castle by way of the plumbing. Severus Snape, Slytherin's head of house, is also the potions master, potions usually being liquid. And finally, Ravenclaw aligns with the element of air, having an eagle as its symbol and blue, like the sky, for its chief color. The four champions in the Triwizard Tournament also each align with one of the Hogwarts houses. Harry is obviously the Gryffindor champion, and Cedric is the Hufflepuff champion. Fleur de la Cour, on the other hand, a Beaubaton student, is the virtual Ravenclaw champion, and Victor Crumb of Durmstrang is the virtual Slytherin champion, because while they're at Hogwarts, Fleur and Victor sit at the Ravenclaw and Slytherin tables, respectively. And the way that the students and teachers from these schools arrive at Hogwarts reflects the elements that these houses are aligned with. The Bobaton delegation descends from the air in a blue carriage, the element and color of Ravenclaw, and the carriage is drawn by flying horses. The ship carrying the Durmstrang students and their headmaster rises up from within the lake like a submarine surfacing on the water, which is Slytherin's element. There's another alignment between each Triwizard Tournament task and the four elements, plus an alignment between the tasks and creatures that alchemists, especially Paracelsus, who's mentioned in the Harry Potter books, called elemental spirits or beings. Fire is the element for the first task, which features fire-breathing dragons. The elemental being that Paracelsus associated with fire is the salamander, which is a kind of lizard, like a dragon, though other alchemists simply linked dragons to this element. Air is the element for the unexpected task of the Yule Ball, which makes four tasks total, just as Harry is the fourth champion. The elemental being linked to the Yule Ball is the sylph, S-Y-L-P-H, described by Paracelsus as an invisible spirit of the air. He believed each elemental being could move easily only through their own element, so this meant that in fire, sylphs burn, in water, they drown, and in earth, they get stuck. Fleur, the champion who excels at this task, is a bit like a sylph or part sylph herself, as a part Vila witch, and this may explain why she doesn't fare very well at the other tasks. She does, in fact, catch on fire during the first task, fails to retrieve her sister from the lake, and is incapacitated during the final task. 
Water is the very obvious element linked to the task of retrieving the hostages from the lake. And the elemental being linked to this task is the Undine, U-N-D-I-N-E, a mythical water creature often treated as interchangeable with sirens, selkies, and mermaids, which the tournament champions encounter in the lake. Finally, Earth is the element aligned with the last task, which begins in a hedge maze grown on the Quidditch pitch, but ends, for Harry and Cedric, in a graveyard. The elemental being associated with this task is one that Rowling first showed readers in the second book, Chamber of Secrets, when Harry comes to the burrow and engages in the game of throwing garden gnomes over the hedge. Gnomes are the elemental being Paracelsus associated with the element of Earth. In this task, the champions attempt to find their way through a maze, just as the gnomes' underground homes seem rather maze-like. But the maze that the champions are in is made of hedges, which is what the Weasleys throw their gnomes over when they want them out of the garden, though they always come back. The four tournament tasks each align with a champion, a Hogwarts house, an element, and an elemental being. Goblet of Fire is the book in which Harry is first exposed to the wider wizarding world, a world beyond Hogwarts, Hogsmeade, Diagon Alley, even beyond the British Isles. The number four is traditionally how the world is described. There are four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, and we still speak of the Earth as having four corners, though we know perfectly well that it's a sphere. In the fourth book, Harry learns a spell called Four Points that lets him navigate the maze by using his wand like a compass. We are repeatedly reminded in this book of both the wider world beyond Hogwarts and of the four cardinal directions and other symbols associated with them. Alchemists linked these directions to the elements. North is linked to earth, south to fire, east to air, and west to water. In Genesis, the world is described as divided by four rivers, with the Garden of Eden at the center of the world, though it's a different four rivers in Mesopotamian cosmology, and yet a different configuration in Hinduism, in which a sacred four-sided mountain is the world's center and the starting point for four rivers that flow to the four quarters of the world. In Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell writes about the four corners of the world as seen by multiple ancient civilizations. The dome of heaven rests on the quarters of the earth, sometimes supported by four kings, dwarfs, giants, elephants, or turtles. Hence the traditional importance of the mathematical problem of the quadrature of the circle. It contains the secret of the transformation of heavenly into earthly forms. The quadrature of the circle, or a circle with a cross inscribed within it, like the logo for this podcast, is a symbol that has long been used to represent the Earth, and it resembles a compass as well. It's also the image of an ancient board game design that was used around the world for a variety of race games. This Earth sign design is seen in other ancient games as well, such as Pachisi, the national game of India, which in turn became the Western game of Parchisi. Parchisi is also called the Royal Game of India, because royalty once used members of harems in costumes matched to the color of each team as playing pieces on life-sized outdoor playing boards, much like Harry, Ron, and Hermione in the life-sized chess game. The winner is the one who gets all four of their pieces, red, blue, yellow, or green, home first, home being the center of the board. The goal in a medieval labyrinth, like the one in Shard Cathedral, is also the center of the labyrinth, which has again the overall appearance of a cross inscribed within a circle. This is similar to the Triwizard Champions trying to get to the center of the maze to win. They must reach home. In other words, Rowling has them playing a life-sized Parcheesi game, though she might give it another name, Ludo, the first name of Ludo Bagman. Ludo is the Latin word for game in general, but it's also the best-known name for the variant of Pachisi played in the UK, J.K. Rowling's home. Thus, she likens the entire world to a game board sharing its name with the head of Magical Games and Sports, and the champions are all racing to get home. 
In Goblet of Fire, Harry encounters wizards from other countries for the first time, and his experience of completeness and wholeness in the fourth book is connected repeatedly to the number four, starting with Harry being the fourth champion. Rowling also seems to have aligned the Hogwarts houses with the four major regions of the British Isles at the time that Hogwarts was founded. England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. The geographic areas served by Hogwarts, and probably the Ministry in London. As far as we know, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales don't have separate ministries from England, and children from these countries attend one school, Hogwarts. These four regions seem to be considered one political entity by wizards, though they're treated as separate for Quidditch competition, just as it is with rugby and football for muggles. The Sorting Hat gives us a clue about these four regions aligning with each house by telling us that the founders came from four distinct types of landscapes. In the Sorting Hat song from Goblet of Fire, the first new song since the first book, the hat sings, Bold Gryffindor from Wild Moorfair, Ravenclaw from Glen, Sweet Hufflepuff from Valley Broad, Shrew Slytherin from Fen. And if that sounds like Jingle Bells to you, you're not wrong. The tune happens to work perfectly with the meter of the Sorting Hat song. Try it sometime. At any rate, Fair Ravenclaw from Glen includes a Scots Gaelic term for a long, deep valley, a glen. Shrewd Slytherin from Fen not only refers to wetlands that are characteristic of large areas of Ireland, water is Slytherin's element, but the word Fenian, F-E-N-I-A-N, refers to Irish patriots. Sweet Hufflepuff from Valley Broad could refer to the valleys of Wales, while Bold Gryffindor from Wild Moor could refer specifically to the West Country of England, where J.K. Rowling grew up, which is known for its moors. Godric's Hollow is also described as a West Country village, and Gryffindor's first name was Godric. These alignments are suggested in shorthand in the Sorting Hat song, but it's specifically the version of the song that appears in Goblet of Fire, the fourth book, in which Roland creates many four-part alignments connected to the houses, the tournament champions, the four traditional elements of fire, earth, air, and water, the four elemental beings, and the tournament tasks themselves. Heraldry can further reveal support for Gryffindor being aligned with England, Ravenclaw with Scotland, Slytherin with Ireland, and Hufflepuff with Wales. Medieval English battle flags with repeated gold lions on a deep red ground look like they could have been designed by Gryffindor, and they wouldn't look out of place in the Gryffindor common room. The meanings linked to heraldic colors and symbols reinforce Rowling's choices for the houses. Gryffindor's red signifies a warrior, brave and strong, but also generous and just, as well as standing for martyrdom, which brings Harry's sacrifice to mind in the seventh book. Gold is linked to generosity and elevation of the mind. A heraldic lion also symbolizes dauntless courage, and a griffin, evoked by the name of Gryffindor, means valor and bravery. In Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, Rowling introduces a character whose family coat of arms seems to owe a debt to Gryffindor, Rufus Scrimger, the minister who succeeds Cornelius Fudge. His coat of arms shows a rampant gold lion holding a sword on a deep red ground. He's first described through the eyes of the Muggle Prime Minister in the chapter called The Other Minister. Rufus Scrimger looked rather like an old lion. There were streaks of grey in his mane of tawny hair and his bushy eyebrows. He had keen yellowish eyes behind a pair of wire-rimmed spectacles and a certain rangy, loping grace. The name Rufus means red-haired, so Rowling is combining red and gold yet again, in addition to the coat of arms for the Scrimger family looking very Gryffindorish. Scrimger is a Scottish clan, but the arms appear very English, with the red field and gold lion, so perhaps Scrimger is meant to be a fictional version of King James I of England, who was King James VI in Scotland, but rose to the English throne after the death of Elizabeth I. Ravenclaw's colors are called blue and bronze by J.K. Rowling, but bronze is not a heraldic medal. There are only two, silver and gold. Bronze is close in appearance to gold, so for the purposes of examining the house's heraldry, let's call Ravenclaw's colors blue and gold, which in heraldry can look like bronze. 
The Scottish flag is blue and silver in heraldic terms, since white is used to represent silver on paper. This flag has a white cross on a blue ground, which is called the Cross of St. Andrew, the patron saint of Scotland. However, Rowling's virtual Ravenclaws from Beaubaton are French. The French flag used at the same time as the Gryffindor-like flag once used by England is blue with gold fleur-de-lis. There's also a link between Scotland and France due to both often being at odds, historically, with the same enemy, England. The name for this is the Auld Alliance, A-U-L-D. The tie between Ravenclaw and Scotland is even easier to see with the help of the pseudo-Ravenclaws from France, who first appear in Goblet of Fire. The flag of Wales has neither black nor yellow, which are Hufflepuff's colors, but another flag associated with Wales does, the flag of St. David, the patron saint of Wales. In heraldry, black is called sable, and yellow represents gold on paper, just as white represents silver. So we can say that the flag of St. David shows a gold cross on a sable ground. Thus, Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, and Hufflepuff all have gold for their heraldic medal, though only Gryffindor is said to have gold. The heraldic meaning associated with sable, black, is constancy or grief which is appropriate for the house that loses its favorite son, Cedric Diggory, in the fourth book. The badger, the mascot of Hufflepuff, is also known for digging in dirt, another link to Hufflepuff's element, earth. An industry for which Wales is well known also involves digging into earth, coal mining, and sable, black, is the color of coal. Ireland is the only region of the British Isles that doesn't share an island with the other three regions. It's separate, just as the founder Salazar Slytherin is eventually separate from his fellow founders. And yes, Northern Ireland shares the same island as the Republic of Ireland, but these are muggle political distinctions and we have no evidence that wizards pay attention to this. As far as we know, the Irish National Quidditch team represents what muggles call Ulster plus the Republic of Ireland. Slytherin is also the only house with silver as its metal, pairing it with green. Ireland is, of course, famous for its rolling green countryside, but a couple of Irish flags use not just green and silver, but also gold. A flag with a gold harp on green was used by the Irish Catholic Federation, 1642 to 1649. The harp has silver strings. Another green, gold, and silver flag is the Fenian flag, captured by British forces in County Dublin in 1867. Its green stripes alternate with silver, which is to say white, and it has 64 eight-pointed gold stars on a green field in the upper left. Silver and gold are both linked to Slytherin. The locket Voldemort makes into a horcrux is gold. Rowling places the founding of Hogwarts roughly in the era of the First Crusades. At the time, green wasn't used in heraldry in Western Europe because it was the color of Islam. This avoidance of green in Western European heraldry didn't change until the 15th century. So Slytherin is not only the one house with silver for its heraldic medal, but the heraldic color of green, which crusaders considered the color of the enemy at the time Hogwarts was founded. Finally, the emblem of Slytherin is the snake. Snakes were supposedly sent packing from Ireland by St. Patrick, though they may not have existed there in the first place. Snakes are also a symbol of Satan, who took the form of a snake in the story about Adam and Eve being expelled from the Garden of Eden. So Rowling chose a snake as the emblem for the founder who speaks to snakes and may have come from Ireland. Victor Crumb, a virtual Slytherin when he sits at that Hogwarts table, is from Bulgaria and wears red to represent his country when he plays against Ireland. However, when Victor catches the snitch in the World Cup final, winning the title for Ireland, he becomes a virtual Irish player. So he's a pseudo-Slytherin even before reaching Hogwarts, securing a victory for the national Quidditch team whose country aligns with Slytherin, just as Ravenclaw aligns with Scotland, Hufflepuff with Wales, and Gryffindor with England. This alignment continues with the tournament tasks, both the official three plus the Yule Ball, the unexpected task. The World Cup triumph of Ireland, the region aligning with Slytherin at the beginning of the fourth book, could also be considered foreshadowing for Voldemort's triumph at the end of the book. If anyone is the epitome of a Slytherin, it's the Dark Lord, the heir of Slytherin himself. 
So Goblet of Fire is bookended by two Slytherin victories, first a symbolic one, then a literal one. Fire is the element aligned with the first task. This links it to Gryffindor and, in turn, to England. In addition to the medieval English banners with gold lions on a red ground, another common standard used to represent England is a flag with the red cross of St. George, patron saint of England. This flag shows a red cross on a white ground. St. George is most renowned for killing dragons, the elemental creatures at the center of the first task. Harry, the Gryffindor champion, born in Godric's Hollow, home of his house's founder, is the champion who wins this task, getting his egg away from the dragon more quickly than the other champions. The Yule Ball, as a task, is aligned with the element of air, and thus to Ravenclaw. That in turn links the Yule Ball to Scotland. The band playing at the ball is the Weird Sisters. In Shakespeare's Macbeth, the three witches who prophesy Macbeth's downfall are called the Weird Sisters. Macbeth is often called the Scottish play by actors and other theatre folk who avoid saying the name of the play under certain circumstances. And in the Spanish translation of Goblet of Fire, the band is called La Brujas de Macbeth, Macbeth's Witches. One of the instruments in the band, a set of bagpipes, relies on air to maintain its sound and it's indelibly linked to Scotland. All of the champions, and even Harry's best friend, Ron, and Ron's sister, Ginny, have a link to Ravenclaw and or Bobaton during the course of the ball. Victor goes with Hermione, a near Ravenclaw, who wears blue, Ravenclaw's color. Cedric goes with Cho Chang, seeker on the Ravenclaw Quidditch team. Harry goes with Parvati Patil from his own house, but she abandons him to spend time with a boy from Bobaton, a virtual Ravenclaw. Even Ron goes with a Ravenclaw, Parvati's sister Padma, and Ginny goes with Neville, but meets her first boyfriend at the ball, the Ravenclaw Michael Corner, though we don't learn about this until the next book. And of course, the first girls Harry and Ron ask to the ball are Cho and Fleur. Fleur Delacour, a virtual Ravenclaw who hails from France, Scotland's traditional ally, is arguably the champion who wins at this task, since she's so much in demand as a Yule Ball partner. She goes with Roger Davies, captain of the Ravenclaw Quidditch team. In the task linked to water and therefore to Slytherin House, and thus to Ireland, which is surrounded by water and known for its watery fens, the champions encounter merpeople who are not that attractive, unlike many depictions of mermaids and mermen from around the world, even the mermaid in the painting in the prefect's bath that Harry sees when he takes the egg there. Instead, these people have green bodies and hair and long, sharp teeth, making them resemble a magical creature from Irish folklore called the Merrow, M-E-R-R-O-W. Victor Crumb, both a virtual Slytherin and a virtual Irish Quidditch player, becomes a half-shark and rescues his hostage, Hermione, before the other champions. He can be considered the champion who wins this task. Finally, the last task is linked to Earth and to Hufflepuff, and thus to the country of Wales, known for its coal mines, which are like underground mazes. The labyrinth slash maze for the final task is grown on the Quidditch pitch itself. Cedric could arguably be called the champion who wins this task. Harry certainly thought so. Harry only takes the cup with him because Cedric refuses to do it on his own. In Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, J.K. Rowling introduces the idea of the Founders hailing from England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales in a new Sorting Hat song, and then links each tournament champion, each task, the four alchemical elemental beings, and the elements of fire, air, water, and earth to each of these regions of the British Isles, all in the service of her elaborate game. You've been listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. All music heard on Quantum Harry is composed and performed by B. L. Purdom. 
Whether you're streaming on iTunes, Stitcher, CastBox, or another podcatcher, please leave a rating and or a comment and share episodes of Quantum Harry with your friends. Again, to see the many images described in this episode, go to at QH Podcast on Twitter. In the pinned tweet, click on the link to the episode guide and scroll down to episode 18 to find the link to the video version of this episode, if it is after the video posting date. As always, when you watch on YouTube, please leave a comment and or rating. Next time on Quantum Harry, episode 19, Not Playing to Win. The final installment in this three-episode arc, examining the role of toys, fairy tales, and games in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, including a look at how the fourth obstacle to the Philosopher's Stone aligns with this book. I hope you'll join me.